Thanks. Thanks very much, Rachel. Great to be back here at Asia Society. Um, as, as Rachel mentioned, my purpose in about the next uh, 21 and a half minutes is to uh, set a bit of context for this evening's concert, uh, introduce it, and uh, just in, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, let me make clear that I am A, not an expert uh, in this particular kind of music. Uh, my expertise is, is more uh, east of where this music comes from in Central Asia. B, I have never heard this concert before, this program. Uh, C, no one else has ever heard this program before either. So basically, we're all in the same boat. Uh, and, and that's great, because the point of this is it's something fresh and new uh, and, and very, very innovative and experimental. So my purpose is, is really to, to kind of describe the, the framework or the parameters of the experiment. Uh, and, and as Rachel mentioned, I'll, after a few minutes, I'll invite uh, Feruz Nishanova to join me on the stage, and, and I'll uh, get her to talk a little bit also about the role that she's played uh, as director of the Aga Khan Music Initiative in making this concert happen. So a couple of things to point out about the music you're going to hear. There's been a lot of uh, music from Iran that's been brought to the United States over the last 20, 30 years in the context of, of uh, various world music festivals, concerts, presentations, touring groups, a lot of them here at Asia Society, others uh, over across town in, in Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, the, um, the World Music Institute. Most of that music, overwhelmingly, the music that we hear coming from Iran is uh, what you could call classical music, Iranian classical music, uh, the Daska music, which is a, uh, a repertoire based in a, an old system of modally organized music uh, that it's canonized. It, it has um, uh, a lot of conventions and, and rules uh, that are highly theorized. They're passed on uh, through a, 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 a tradition of master and disciple or master and apprentice. Uh, they are played with great virtuosity uh, by people who are the equivalent or the analog of Western classical musicians. So that's what mostly we understand in the West when we think or what we've heard from Iran. The music that's being presented tonight is utterly different. It represents uh, an utterly different layer of Iranian music. And uh, that is, it, it represents a kind of music that's from the very south of Iran, uh, the, the coastal region bordering on the Persian Gulf, uh, a province called Boucher. Uh, and so you can call this music Boucheri. Uh, Boucher, being on the Persian Gulf, it's, it's one of the old port cities of Iran, and it's a very cosmopolitan place. It's been an, a, a port where uh, trade has been conducted for a long time with Africa, with India, and with the Arab lands that lie just across the Persian Gulf to the west and to the north, Iraq being to the north and the, the Emirates, uh, the islands uh, uh, in the Persian Gulf, and of course Saudi Arabia being over to the west. So it's a cosmopolitan place that's absorbed a lot of different musical influences, and these are reflected in the kind of music, the kind of folk music that you hear from Boucher. And that's the kind of music that you're going to hear tonight. Iran, of course, it's a, it's a big country. It's a, a country with a, a large number of regional traditions, uh, up in the northeast, you have Khorasan, uh, a whole other tradition there that's more closely related to Central Asia and, and Turkmen music. In the southwest, or southeast rather, you have the Baluchi traditions, uh, which again are completely different uh, from, um, say, the classical tradition. Um, in the northwest, you have a lot of uh, Azeri influence, very strong Azeri community around Tabriz and many other uh, regional traditions. So Boucher and Boucheri music is one of those. It's a folk music. It's not a highly theorized tradition like the, the Daska, the classical music. Uh, the instrument you're going to hear 
uh, that one of the, the, the main instrument from Iran is a bagpipe. Now, we don't think of bagpipes normally. We don't associate them with Iran. But in fact, bagpipes uh, come probably originally from the Middle East. I'm a bagpipe player. I play uh, Highland pipes from Scotland and also the bellows pipes, Illin pipes from Ireland that you, you play with your elbow. Uh, most bagpipes have uh, uh, chanter, which is the uh, uh, pipe that you finger, uh, and drones that play a steady pitch, a drone pitch that you hear against the melody. This Iranian bagpipe is interesting because it has only a chanter, has no drone pipes. Uh, it's played for in a traditional context in wedding ceremonies or wedding festivities um, for dancing, uh, for festivity, merriment. Uh, and here it's going to be played with, with great uh, virtuosity uh, by uh, one of the musicians, uh, the featured musicians in the concert, Saeed uh, Shanbehzadeh, who grew up in Boucher and learned this instrument as a, as a youngster starting when he was seven, hanging out with wedding musicians. Uh, he's also got some other folk instruments uh, that, that he'll play for you tonight, uh, all wind instruments. Uh, Nejofti, it's a kind of clarinet, double clarinet. Um, he's got a, um, a, a reed flute that's actually not from Iran originally. He found it in Paris, where he now lives, but he's playing it in a style from Boucher. So that's, and his son, Nahib, is playing these um, uh, goblet drums that you see there, uh, which are uh, played widely in Iran, different parts of Iran, and also in the Arab lands. So that's the sort of, that's the Iranian side. Now, the, the, the other special feature of tonight's concert is it's a marriage, a kind of joining of Iranian music from this Boucheri tradition with uh, music from Syria. Uh, of two different sorts. One, or first, uh, music uh, played by Basil Rajub, who is a saxophone player from Syria. Now, is saxophone a traditional instrument in Syria? No. Um, and that is, is also an interesting point. How did Basil come to play saxophone in Syria? Well, uh, he grew up in Aleppo, which is also a very cosmopolitan city, a lot of different musical influences. He grew up hearing European music and Syrian music uh, and, and all kinds of things. He got interested in jazz. He had an aunt who, who had a jazz collection, and he loved jazz. So I think this is also an important lesson, maybe, from tonight's concert. It's a sort of challenge to uh, notions of essentialism, that you know, if you come from Syria, you, you need to play the oud or you need to play the violin. Uh, he plays the saxophone, and he got interested in Western music. Uh, he played Western music, in fact, before he played Syrian music. Later, he got interested in Syrian music. Uh, another Syrian musician who's uh, playing in the concert tonight as, as a guest of the core group um, is Kenan uh, Adwani. Uh, and he is a, a, a master on the uh, oud. Uh, he grew up playing the traditional classical music of, uh, of Syria, the maqam. Uh, he learned that also through the, the master disciple system and later at the uh, conservatory or the High Institute of Music in Damascus. And all of these musicians uh, met actually not in the Middle East or not in Iran, but traveling. Uh, moving around the world, they encountered one another uh, in the case of, of Basel and Said, first of all, in just by chance in Shanghai while they were both playing at a music festival there. Later, they met again in Paris, and that's when they decided, well, they like each other's music. Let's try to do something together. So here's a kind of experiment in musical cosmopolitanism, people meeting, people trying to find a common language. How do you take traditions that are really quite different, even though we might think of them, well, they're all from the Middle East, all from the same area. But they're very, very different. Folk music from the south of Iran, uh, a saxophone player from Aleppo, an oud player from Damascus, all of them then sort of scattering to the four corners of the earth. Said and, and Nahib moved to Paris, where they now live. Basel lives in Switzerland. 
uh, Keenan lives in Philadelphia. Uh, they've been up to now, literally up to this evening, uh, they've been a virtual group. They rehearse via Skype. So what you're seeing tonight is, is, is sort of a, a physical re, reunification or unification uh, of, of uh, people who have, have been virtual presences to one another. So this is an exciting moment to see what have they been able to do, how have they been able to find a kind of glue that holds together these different musical languages. And I, I should add that just from what I've heard uh, of the group rehearsing, I think it's a very courageous experiment, a courageous attempt to find this musical lingua franca. A lot of the, the kind of cross-cultural fusion experiments that probably a lot of us know or are familiar with, uh, for instance, going back, say, to the famous East meets West uh, concerts and recordings of Ravi Shankar and Yehudi Menuhin. I grew up with those recordings. I was very inspired by those. Uh, or later experiments that have, have mixed, say, Persian classical music with Indian classical music, raga music. Those kinds of, of cross-cultural fusions have always existed within the framework of some kind of modal system. In other words, a canon, something that defines musical intervals, musical scales, so that it's easier if you're a player to grab on to something, to say, OK, we'll improvise in this mode or that mode. The technical term for that is modal noodling. In other words, you, you define a set of pitches, a set of rules, a set of constraints, if you will, and you work within those. And, and that gives you something to go on uh, if you're improvising. These musicians don't really have that because this music is not, it's not really modal. It doesn't have this defined theory or system of, of, of um, constraints. It's based more on musicians working together through gesture, through very short melodic motifs, uh, through searching for something common in these uh, different musical languages. Uh, jazz, in the case of, of, of Basel, the, this Boucheri folk music, and the classical macam that Kenan grew up with. So we're all present tonight at, at an experiment. And it's sort of like walking, watching a tightrope walker. You know, is the guy going to stay on the wire, or are they going to fall off? And so we're all going to be the judges of that. Uh, how well do they stay on the wire and, and come up with something that's really interesting because uh, the, the pieces are named. You have, there's a program. They'll announce the names of the pieces, and, and they've worked out a framework of the pieces. But what actually is going to happen tonight, no one knows. So we'll see. So at this point, uh, I want to invite my colleague, Feruz Nishinova, to come up and join me here. And I'm going to ask her to talk a little bit, because she um, has really been uh, the one who, who brought this group together and put it in the form in which you're seeing it now as a, as a performance on a stage. Uh, Feruz, come on, come on up. Uh, you can sit there at that mic. These are on. Um, Feruz is the, the director of the Aga Khan uh, Music Initiative based in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, uh, she has been working uh, with uh, a very interesting and exciting program, uh, the, the Music Initiative, that's active now in what, nine countries, 11 countries? How many countries? Twelve, Twelve countries uh, in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Central Asia, in South Asia, and uh, putting together different kinds of, of, um, of, of, of communities, putting them in contact, developing, devising interesting projects and programs and initiatives to um, create uh, communication and exchange, new kind of a new era of, of musical exchange. So let me ask you first just about the title, the name of this concert, Sound the Encounter. Where did that come from and what does it represent? It was dictated, I think, because the, um, the first encounter of these musicians, as you've mentioned, happened completely by chance. Um, and just as now, we had very little idea of what was going to happen. And um, we were rehearsing a different project. 
And we had this beautiful rehearsal space in the middle of Paris, in, in the center of Paris, and it was a space reserved for a ballet company. So it was pitch black with a few skylights through which the light was trickling through. And uh, when this brave idea came up and musicians said, well, let's try and see what this is going to be, there was this dead silence that represented fear, I think, and apprehension. And we, we were in this huge, dark, black room with some little streaks of light. And suddenly, there was this sound. They, 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 they don't speak the same language any longer. Um, and it was really a conversation that they didn't rehearse, that they didn't know anything about. They just jumped into it and, and started talking. And somehow, it was so harmonious and so beautiful and so intense and grabbing at the same time that in that dark space, suddenly there was this sound that entered and, and, and took over and created this encounter. And um, I did two things besides listening. I uh, was very lucky to have our filmmaker present in the room because he was re rehearsing a completely different project. So I asked him to film that very moment of creation of that second. So you will see some of it today at the introductory film. And the, the, the second thing I did, I answered an email uh, from a fellow presenter who said, well, do you have anything new and crazy uh, planned? And I said, well, talk about that. <laughs> Sound the encounter. That's how it helped. So Sound the Encounter is actually the name of the group, not just the name of the program. Is that right? I think yes. I think we've begun to. We we call it a project because the group uh, it's it, it's it's a it's a collective of likely-minded individuals who share one very specific gift. They are fully conversant in their own tradition or traditions, I should say, because every single one of them uh, is uh, lucky enough and, and knowledgeable enough to be fully conversant in several traditions that their region represent. But the gift is that they are by no means limited by that tradition. So they are able, while be being fully respectful of it, use this tradition as a trampoline, as a platform, to create a new contemporary expression that is tradition-inspired but not tradition-limited. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, col a collective of very likely-minded individuals that believe in not imitating music but creating new, new conversation. And in doing so, they help the Akakan Music Initiative advance our quest to recreate the age-old exchange that always existed among the artistic communities that spread all along the great Silk Route or Spice Route, call them whatever you, whatever you feel more uh, comfortable with, the great trade routes of, of, of our universe. Um, and if you think, if you, if you look back at what those trade routes always um, served as catalyst for, they very often served um, as platforms for some of the most exciting creations in poetry, astronomy, uh, medicine, uh, and, and music, and architecture. And about 100 years ago, I think that exchange stopped or slowed down very much. And when we think of fusion, especially the artistic fusion, we always think about East-West. And through the work of the music initiative, we slowly came to the realization that we could only support the tradition this much by preserving it. Uh, but to really revitalize it, we had to recreate the exchange of the artistic, among the artistic communities that used to share that common language, but no longer share the spoken language. Yet they allow the ancient language of their musical tradition to come in and let them develop a new body. So this, this further development is happening through exchange, through meeting, encounter, exchange, and innovation. Absolutely, and musicians note themselves that it was very important for them not to imitate each other, or not to put limits of their own connaissance or knowledge and, and sort of say, well, okay, I will do this part because I know it really well, and then you do part that you know well, and let's see, maybe we can somehow find a connection between it. But the, the, the real goal was to truly create a conversation. Um, 
that is completely newly, newly made, newly developed, uh, but based uh, very much on, on, I think they've, they've all realized the amount of knowledge and gratitude they had for their own traditions. Uh, because most of them have left their homelands behind, as, as, you've, no as you've noted. So they've also mentioned that it's a way to go back to their homelands. It's a, it's a way to revisit the land they left behind um, and pay an homage, and at the same time create a contemporary expression of that sound. So in conclusion, I suppose we, we should go full circle back to what Rachel Cooper said in the beginning, that here we have a case of artists being pioneers in starting conversations that go across cultures. And we can only hope that perhaps life will imitate art and politicians will also start talking to each other and having it, these conversations. It, it reminds me, uh, you know, in the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, the, the organization that I represent with honor, we have an oldest program that is called the Aga Khan Award for Architecture that um, celebrates the innovation in architecture that has truly made a difference to the life of the communities that, that the innovation was created for. And um, a couple of cycles back, one of our winners uh, was a group of people representing uh, Turkish and Greek uh, parts of Cyprus. And uh, two people accepting the award were not architects, but the mayors of the Greek and Turkish uh, part of the island. And when they accepted the award, um, someone posed a question and said, well, how, how, how could it happen? How could you suddenly overcome the conflict that lasted for more than a generation? And one of them said, well, you know, we were working on an irrigation system. And we were working on it completely separately for the same for the same piece of land. And at some point at one of the meetings, I looked at my team and I said, "Well, you know, when the water comes to the to the national border, what does the water do?" And he said, "The silence in the you could you could cut the silence in the room with a knife." And he said, "That when we that's when we picked up the phones and called the other side of the border." Um, and hopefully what these musicians have done, uh, letting the music flow through just like that water and um, overtake the space and create something that they truly celebrate. They celebrate their unity through the sound. I very much hope that this will serve as an example to the greater world. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope you all enjoyed the concert. Thanks for coming. <laughs>